Well, good morning, everyone. Let's begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the opportunity we have again this morning to open your word and to review uh, the light that you've given us on Daniel's last vision. And uh, so we just pray that uh, you can give us clear minds and an understanding and open heart uh, to receive these truths and to be able to be corrected when we are in error and uh, to show your character to others. We pray that you can bless each person in the struggles and difficulties they have and that you can guide and direct them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in Daniel chapter 10, so I'm going to be reading from my notes, my paper that I've written so far on Daniel's last vision. Um, it says, we begin this study with Daniel 10, where Daniel's last vision begins. Other material and passages that we have examined will be referenced, especially as they relate to the chronology of the text here. We will demonstrate our methodology in regard to the symbolic use of numbers. Our analysis of the text in both the meaning and the symbols associated with strong numbers. Our dependence upon line upon line is understood as the main application of Isaiah 28 for our time and the parallels between the past and the present. And the line of Miller's history as a template by the light of which all other histories are to be understood. Some of these things may seem strange and unfamiliar to the reader, but we ask you to bear with us as we will illustrate this as we go along. In the footnotes, we will list minor numerical considerations, such as the significance of the symbols extracted from Strong's numbers. These can apply as periods of days, even hours, months, or years, extract symbolic formulas, which relate to primary symbols, or see the representations of dates. For instance, the name Daniel is represented in Strong's dictionary as H1840, which we attach to August 11th, 1840. This is not applied arbitrarily or done haphazard, but is seen in the context of the historic interpretation of the text as it applies to the present. So I don't know, is that those two paragraphs clear? Uh, that is, um, I know it's probably hard to just follow and read the you know, first thing, but, but this is the way that we've approached things. So somebody who is not really familiar with this movement would have a really hard time understanding some of this, but as I'm just laying out what we're, we've done, uh, this is how we've approached studying Daniel's last vision. Now, when we, went through chapter 10 we didn't have uh like the strong numbers like i have here so this is something i did uh, in in working on these notes i put uh chapter 10 just as we did chapter 11 with uh the strong numbers and with the footnotes so this is this would be going through it a little bit differently than we did originally so in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Dan, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Now, in the King James, when we look at this verse, and it says the time appointed was long, you know, often we would think the time appointed is going to be what, what Hebrew word? The um, word... Yeah, Moed. Now, in this this time, we have a different Hebrew number, right? So you're going to have uh, this this number here. Tzaba, Tzeba, Tzaba, Tzeawa. I'm not sure. Tzeawa. There's two different ways it can be spelled. Here, um, I'd have to look at the Hebrew. But anyway, it's a word that means a mass of persons. Uh, or at least it comes from 6633. Now, 6633, um, we're, we're familiar with that. What's 6633? I didn't put this in these notes here, but this, this word that's translated as time, appoint, time appointed in the King James 
6635, and it comes from 6633. Does anybody remember what 6633 is as a number? Is that related to the, the footnote you have there? Yeah, oh, I do have the footnote there. Yeah. So there are 6,633 6, days from September 9th, or not, pardon me, September 11th, 2001 to November 9th, 2019. Okay. So, I mean, is that interesting? So somebody, of course, who's reading this paper, they just started reading it and, you know, they're going to look at this time appointed and they're going to see my footnote. Uh, they're not really going to have the context to understand that. So I say this significance will be noted later, right? But the fact that it's 6635, not 6633, uh, doesn't really matter in this context, right? As a symbol, we can say this word comes from 6633, so we can relate it, okay? Does that, does that make sense to people? Do we accept the idea that when we look at uh, the Strong's number and it tells us it's from 6633, that we can relate it to, to that way. Now, the idea of the meaning of the word is because it's not moed, which is a feast or an appointed time, right? That is the feast on the Jewish calendar and can refer to a congregation as well, to those that, that come to the feast. But here, this word, uh, tzaba, it means a mass of persons or figurative things, especially regularly organized for war, an army, by implication, a campaign, literally or figuratively. So it can refer to a battle, right? And, and then we have uh, the word long, 1419, and that word we're familiar with, gadol, right? So it could say a battle or a conflict. It could say that you could have been translated the conflict was great, right? Whether literally or figuratively. Now, in the context here of Daniel chapter 10, it makes much more sense to address it as the conflict or controversy that this is the conflict between Christ and Satan that's being described here. Does that make sense to people? That we can see that this is really addressing the great controversy. It's not addressing a period of time, even though we can say that that time appointed refers to 6633, which is a period of time from 9-11 to November 9th, 2019. So you can see the sort of layers that, that uh, we were looking at when we when we're studying Daniel's last vision. Okay, now when we look at uh, the third year of Cyrus, regarding the chronology of this vision, there's been some confusion as to the date of Cyrus' third year here referenced. Oh, and I just got to go back. Well, just so remember that he understood the thing, that's the debar, and had understanding of the vision, the marat, right? So the thing that he doesn't understand, we're going to see later, is going to be the prophetic mirror. The kazon is not the topic when it says the vision there, and it's going to be the marat. So uh, regarding the chronology of this vision, there's been some confusion as to the date of Cyrus's third year here referenced. In Daniel 1 verse 21, we read, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. This means that the third year mentioned in Daniel 10, 1 cannot be after the first year of Cyrus, right? So if it says that Daniel is going to continue unto the first year of King Cyrus, but if it's talking about the third year here, it can't it cannot be after the first year of Cyrus. There's some other options that we, we hadn't looked at when we studied this. So I say, how is this possible? First, we must recognize that Cyrus' true reign began long before he became king of Babylon, having begun his reign as the king of Persia in 559 BC with the fall of Babylon on October 13, 539 B.C. He be, with the fall of Babylon on October 13, 539 B.C., he became king of lands, while his uncle Darius assumed the title king of Babylon. It was within about two years from the fall of Babylon, with the death of Darius, that Daniel then received this title and became the sole king, uniting the kingdom of Persia. Persia. 
The third year then referenced would be from the fall of Babylon. All right, you said that uh, Daniel received this title. Should it not be Cyrus? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, good. Oops, wrong, wrong keyboard. There we go. Cyrus then received this title and became sole king, uniting the kingdom of Persia. The third year then referenced would be from the fall of Babylon and not from the death of Darius the Mede in the fall of 537. Now, there's there's different ways that we could address this. And, and, and so it's probably something we actually need to study together. Uh, when we reckon his first year from the spring of 536, as seen in Daniel 1 verse 21, while the third year is an ordinal count from the fall of 539 BC, we then reckon his first year. Okay, while the third year is an ordinal count from the fall of 539 BC, with the first year ending in the spring of 538. The third year in this count would begin in the fall of 537 BC. In the diagram below, we illustrate both ways for counting Cyrus's reign, as well as the reigns of Cambyses, False Myrtus, and Darius the Persian. So here you can see this diagram. We got uh, the you know, the fall of Babylon, October, you're going to see it's going to be in, we can count those years, fall of Babylon, that would be the first year of of, um, of Cyrus, if you're going to use that count, right? We have these, <clears throat> Cyrus's decree, so you're going to see there's two years of Darius the Mede, you have the accession of Cyrus in the third year, right? Um, so... I'm not really happy with this. So, so let's look at this other solution. Okay. So this is the way that I originally had done it. But it, 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 another so solution has recently been suggested for the discrepancy, which allows the two dates in Daniel to be consistent. In Daniel 121, saying Daniel continued as a counselor to the king of Babel, kings of Babylon until the first year of Cyrus. This then being when Babylon falls on the night of October 12th to 13th, 539 BC. So in this case, the first year of Cyrus is not counted in the spring, according to Daniel, right? That in the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, he's going to call the first year of Cyrus when Cyrus uh, conquers Babylon. Okay, so in either case, the third year in Daniel 10 would still be in the spring of 536 BC. If we are to argue that the third year is 534 BC, as Uriah Smith and many commentators do, not only do we have a chronological discrepancy, but we have no explanation for the context of chapter 10. What is going on in the heart and mind of Cyrus at that time? The text does not say. The only struggle that fits is his decision to fulfill his purpose as uh, the Lord's shepherd. Saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So what do we think about these, these two options? So we got the one option where we just say, well, in Daniel 10, he's going to count the third year as um, from the fall of Babylon. But that's in an inconsistent use of that a description, right? So if he continues only unto the first year of Cyrus, that, that that could be referring to the time that he's as a counselor to the kings of Babylon. Because once Babylon falls, Daniel isn't, is no longer the third in command of the Babylonian kingdom, so to speak, or whatever you want to call it. He's not a counselor. Like, Obviously, we know Belshazzar is going to make him the third ruler in the kingdom. But once once Babylon is conquered, uh, I mean, Daniel isn't the third ruler in the kingdom, and neither is he a counselor to the kings of Babylon, right? Is is it, Stephen? Do you have a comment on this at all? Well, he does become to Cyrus. Cyrus was going to make him head of uh, there was like 120 something provinces. Provinces, whatever. Right. Um, but that's going to so be separate from what's being said in Daniel chapter one, right? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, um, and where do we find that specifically? That's chapter six. Yes. 
So in chapter six, it pleased Arise to set over the kingdom 120 princes and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first. So we know that Daniel is going to be placed under Cyrus as a, a prince, right? Or uh, a president, I guess it is. Or Darius. Yeah, uh, Darius. Yeah, Darius is going to. So once Babylon is conquered by Cyrus and Darius, Daniel's going to be placed in this position of responsibility. But he's now under a different kingdom. So does it make sense to say that Daniel continued under the Babylonian kingdom unto the first year of Cyrus, which is going to be this year where Darius becomes king? Does that make sense? Because what that does is it allows for an internal consistency in Daniel and how he refers to the reign of Cyrus. I don't know what people think. Maybe not everybody understands this issue. But since Daniel's writing the book of Daniel, and he says that Daniel continues, that is himself, continues unto the first year of Cyrus. And then he talks later about the third year of Cyrus. Either they're, they're not the same count, that is one is counting the first year of Cyrus when Cyrus becomes the sole ruler. The other one talking about the third year of Cyrus from when Babylon falls. But if both of them are counted from when Babylon falls, uh, that would make sense. I don't, but whether that's just in my thinking. I see your point. I think it's a good uh, observation to consider that uh, Daniel chapter one is just speaking about his time as a, a Babylonian counselor. Uh, but would it not be, to me, there's like, it would be nicer if he had just said the first year of Darius rather than to Cyrus. Yes. Yeah, I know. But the thing is, Daniel, so, I mean, there's obviously something that Daniel writing it is not making clear because he would assume that the reader would understand it, right? Uh, how it's, you know, because even then, remember that when Babylon falls in chapter five, you know, Darius the Mede takes the kingdom. Well, Darius, you know, 60 some year old guy, I mean, he's not even there. And actually, when we look at the, the records, even Cyrus isn't there when Belshazzar is, when, when Babylon is taken captive, or, you know, when, it, when it's conquered. Uh, his army is there, and he's the general, but he's not personally there. He comes in later. A few days later, he comes into the city of Babylon, right, you know, personally. Um, so, you know, so Darius the Mede takes the kingdom. Well, it's actually his army that does under the command of Cyrus. So when, when you look at the history of how it describes things, it's a little bit different than we would consider things, I guess. But we get the impression, you know, and that's where a lot of people get confused. It's like, well, Darius, you know, comes in and, and uh, you know, Belshazzar slain by Darius. You know, it almost seems like. But Darius is, you know, back in Persia. Cyrus is there commanding the army. And yet it appears that, you know, Cyrus, if we take this explanation, he in a sense becomes the king of Babylon, right? I mean, we're, we're going to count the first year of Cyrus. But what we would be counting, because Cyrus eventually does become the sole ruler of the kingdom, and yet Daniel's also going to talk about Darius the Mede. You know, I mean, he could have just said C Cyrus took the kingdom, Right but he's going to talk about Darius the Mede. And now I think, of course, there's symbolic reasons why we have Darius and Cyrus um, involved here. Both are mentioned in Daniel. But you could see how uh, Daniel would count Cyrus's reign from the fall of Babylon rather than from the death of Darius. That would be more consistent. So I come I sure is there like documents saying that Darius was in Persia when Babylon fell? Yes. That 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 who was in Persia? Well, you said that uh, Cyrus he's in Darius is in Persia because he's not there. Cyrus is in Babylon, but he's he doesn't enter the city of Babylon until a few days after it falls. Right. So I'm just saying, is there like documentation that Darius was in Persia at that time? Well, yes, 
I mean, I mean, the Nabonidus Chronicles uh, that gives the account of the fall of Babylon shows that Cyrus is the one leading the army, right? Not not Darius, and and Darius wouldn't be traveling with the army, so it doesn't explicitly say Darius. So so part of the thing is Darius isn't called Darius, right? That's that's actually more a title rather than a name. Uh, it's whatever it's Cyaxerxes or however you say his name. Um, so so yeah, it's um, yeah. So he he's he's in Persia. He's not in Babylon. But it, you know, there isn't a document saying when Babylon falls that you know Darius the Mede is in in Persia. But he is based upon the history. Does that that answer your question? I just. Um... There's a, is there like an element of conjecture in that there? It's just like I'm assuming. We don't really know for sure, but it's likely he's in Persia. Yeah, it would be conjecture based upon how old he is and the fact that Cyrus is commanding the army. Because if he was he if he was in Babylon, he would be the commander of the army. Yeah, I think it's a reasonable uh, conjecture. Yeah. Um, but just maybe there's there there's not no... a lot of documentation there. I mean, the only thing we have really is the Nabonidus Chronicles. That's the only contemporary document we have. So, so we have later Greek authors writing about that history. We do have, of course, you know, uh, documents like cuneiform tablets, um, you know, with with dates of kings' reigns and their titles and so forth that are used to mark and date these documents. But they don't tell us, you know, particularly where any of these kings are at any particular time. So, yeah, it is it is uh, an inductive conclusion, right? Which I think is stronger than a conjecture, but, you know, only slightly. It, it's, it's, it's definitely the most likely situation based upon the evidence that we have. Okay. So in either case, the third year of Daniel 10 would still be in the spring of 536. If we are to argue that the third year is 534, we know that that doesn't make sense, right? So that's the main point here. However, we're going to explain it. Um, the best explanation is that the third year is in 536. And then we're going to go through this part, the thing, the time appointed, the vision. The purpose of Daniel's last vision is not to give him understanding of the thing, the debar, or the commandment that relates to the start of the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, since he already understands this. And he also understood the vision, the Marah, the prophecy of the evening and mornings of the 2300 days of Daniel 8. In fact, it is in Daniel 9 that he is given the understanding of both the Debar, also called the matter in the King James Version, and the vision, the Marah. In Daniel's last vision, he is now being given a fuller understanding of these prophetic periods within the larger context of the great controversy, or the time appointed, uh, that's Sabah, referring to military conflict. So I must have looked it up and put the, the way it was spelt in that verse. That was long, and the Gadol, meaning great. That is, he needs to understand the relation between the 70 weeks, the 2300 days, and the 2520 or Chazon. We can see the purpose of Daniel's last vision clearly stated in Daniel 10, 14. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision, the kazone, is for many days. In Daniel 11 itself, the kazone is not only directly named as such in verse 14, so this is not, so it mentioned Daniel 10, 14, and then we also talk about Daniel 11, verse 14, so it's not a typo, I'm actually happens to be verse 14 and 10 and 14 that are tied together, or 10 and 11. So verse 14 in chapter 10 and 11 that I'm tying together. Where the breakers of thy people, or Rome, establishes the vision, the kazon, right? Uh, but it is addressed by different symbols in its different parts throughout the chapter, expressed variously as indignation, um, that's the za'am, 2195, which has two ends, first and last, and the time of the end, 65-6, et and kates, right, 7093. And the appointed time, or moed, sometimes there is a confusion with the expression time appointed in Daniel 10.1, since in other places this expression is translated from the single Hebrew word moed. In Daniel 10.1, 
it should, as we have been noted, be translated as the conflict is great. This does not mean, however, that they are not connected, since the moed, the time appointed, refers to the end of the kazon, the moed here being the Day of Atonement on October 22nd, 1844. So you can see that, that there is um, a, a connection between these, uh, these ideas, that there's this great controversy that's connected to these prophetic periods, and these prophetic periods also are connected to the word moed. I probably need to explain it a little more clearly in that paragraph. At this point, it may be hard to follow for those unfamiliar with the 2520 prophetic mirror. This refers to the combination of two different periods of 2520 years. The first one proclaimed by Miller that ended in 1844 and the one understood by Hiram Edson ending in 1798. It has only been in this time that the significance of these two periods and their connection has been clearly seen. We will bring out the connection of these periods and illustrate them fully as we go through this study. Here we can simply say that these periods form a structure that begins with the start of the 65-year prophecy of Isaiah 7, verse 8, commencing when given in 742 BC and ending with the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1863. It should be not his structure, but this structure. This structure contains four BC dates, 742, 723, 677, and 457, as well as four AD dates, 538, 1798, 1844, and 1863. If these are drawn on a line, the structure and its significance can be clearly seen, and some familiar prophetic periods will draw our attention. The captivity of Hoshea, in 723 and Manasseh's captivity in 677 may be unfamiliar to some readers, but for Seventh-day Adventists, the other dates are generally well known. Right? So, okay. So we're all familiar with that. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is called Hittichel. So the chronology of Daniel's prayer. So I'm going to address this chronology here. The details of the timing of Daniel's prayer is rarely addressed, although though we can date it with accuracy, knowing that the third year of Cyrus here is the third year from the fall of, and that shouldn't have an apostrophe, is the third year from the fall of Babylon. The detail this detail. Sorry, I'm correcting my paper here. This detail helps us in understanding the relation of Cyrus' decree to Darius's decree and their connection to the periods of 70 years in Leviticus 26 and the Babylonian captivity. Though this paper does not address this in detail regarding how Leviticus 26 is fulfilled for ancient Israel in periods of 70 years, an understanding of Leviticus 26 and its relation to Daniel's prophecy has been addressed in other papers. Daniel gives us the date for the last day of his prayer, that is three full weeks, or literally uh, three weeks of days. Shalosha Shabuim Yamim in Hebrew. Uh, since the prayer ends on the 24th day of the first month, this can be dated as April 23rd, 536 BC, whether we use the biblical or Babylonian calendar for this date. The three weeks would be 21 days inclusive, making the first day of his prayer is April 3rd. Further, we connect the events of chapter 10 with the issuing of Cyrus' decree in the spring of 536 BC, which Ezra characterizes as being in the first year of Cyrus. So in the, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, 
beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Now, um, now we can see here that Ezra, in the book of Ezra, Ezra is going to call the first year of Cyrus differently than Daniel is, if we take our second solution, right? So he's going to call the first year of Cyrus uh, when Cyrus is the sole king of Persia, where Daniel is going to be counting it, it appears, uh, consistently from the fall of Babylon. So that's where a lot of the confusion arises. But you can see why in Ezra they're going to consider this more the first year of Cyrus rather than when Babylon falls, because Cyrus does become the king of Persia, the, the, like the sole ruler uh, at that time, right? So, so it's still one of those things that, you know, is going to confuse people. So I need to make it really clear in, in this paper. Address it probably in a bit more detail. Okay, this is followed with the return of the Jews to Jerusalem prior to the fall of the year, with the setting up of the altar on the first day of the seventh month, about five months after the issuing of Cyrus's decree. The journey from Babylon to Jerusalem takes about four months, as we find in Ezra 7. If the Jews left Babylon a few weeks after Cyrus' decree in the second month, they would have arrived at Jerusalem in the sixth month. And it says, and when the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Joshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required and afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of, of the Lord that were consecrated, and of everyone that willingly offered a freewill offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So we can see that this fits in with uh, Cyrus' decree being in the spring, of 536 in what is called here the first year of Cyrus, but in the book of Daniel would have been the third year of Cyrus, right? So that's where the confusion arises, okay? But we can see that this is going to be consistent. Then lifted up, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, uh, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz, his body also like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like a color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. This description matches that of Christ as seen by John in Revelation 1, verse 13 to 15. It's like I have a smaller font there. Yeah, okay. We take this to be Christ. We see the effect that it has upon Daniel, which can be compared to that of Moses, Isaiah, Job, Paul, and as already mentioned, John, when they see Christ. We also believe that this Mar, Mar, Mara vision, right? So that's not the Mara, but Mara vision, represents the proclamation of the gospel as seen in the pattern of Millerite history. More specifically, we see that the three angels' messages as unfolded in Millerite history, represent the progression of the Christian experience. These are contained within the first angel's message, fear God, give him glory, and judgment. This is the work of the Holy Spirit to convince of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, or justification, sanctification, and glorification. These three steps are later seen in Daniel 11.35 and 12 verse 10. As try, purge, make them white, and purified, made white, and tried. These are analogous with the remedy provided to the Laodiceans in Revelation 3, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. 
and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Well, these are not always presented in the same order and with good reason, as in the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans, they are presented chiastically. The eye salve, spiritual discernment, and the ability to see yourself as a sinner is presented last, while it is the first step and connected with justification. The white raiment is sanctification, and the gold that has been tried in the fire is glorification, the character of Christ seen upon the believer. So hopefully that paragraph makes sense. So we can see these three steps in different orders. And I say that in the book to the Laodiceans, they're going to start with the third step, gold tried in the fire, and work their way back to the ISAP. So there's a reason it's presenting the end first and going back to the beginning, the ISAP, which is going to be related to justification. Many look for some experience that will elevate them above their nature and transport them into heavenly places. Some believe that this experience is only for holy men or prophets. However, this experience is available to all through walking and communing with Jesus, through the scriptures, prayer, and taking up your cross daily. It is available to us, Laodiceans. Christ's invitation, as he stands at the door of our hearts, is to all. Any, any questions or comments about, about that? Just a, a comment. I have okay. been looking at um, Genesis 31, right there. It talks about uh, Jacob making a journey from Haran direction. Okay. He might have just been west of Haran, so it might not have been so far, but probably around Haran area where he flees from Laban. And okay. um, talks about three days later, um, Laban gets to hear about it, and then it takes him seven days to catch up with him, and he catches up with him in Galid. So okay. uh, the understanding there is about maybe 10 days, could be, depends how things are being counted, it could be a few days more. Yeah. Um, but generally the distance there is 300 miles or so, so it's near enough, like halfway. But if you're going to go from Babylon to Jerusalem, Obviously, that's longer, but it, it takes uh, Ezra four months. Uh, but this year is like, like even even like half a half a month, and like it's near enough half that journey. So it, not making any. I'm just sort of saying, mm -hmm. maybe because because uh, Jack Beave is traveling with his his sheep and his wives, and they go to Galilee, which is sort of um, south of the Sea of Galilee on the east. Okay, so, so just, uh, distance, just you're looking at a difference between 300 miles and 500 miles. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying it, it's been observed. It's, it's quite quick speed mm -hmm. there. You know that uh, Jacob's going, um, and even for even to catch up with him, obviously he's maybe using so maybe like 40 miles a day. Well, you're saying 300 miles in 10 days or seven days. Well, when Laban gets to hear about it, he's seven days catching up with Jacob. Okay. In Gal okay. and, uh, so okay. he's, so he's Laban's really going 40, 40 miles a day. He's flying. Yeah. So so he's not traveling with sheep. No. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and we don't, well, well, we're not sure exactly, you know, how far it is in exactly the route. I mean, we'd have to map it out a little bit more. But, uh but I would assume that that uh, Jacob's traveling as fast as he can, but Laban can travel faster. Yes. Yeah. Now, of course, where where uh, where Ezra begins, I mean, he's going to begin on the first day of the first month. He just gets to the river. What's the name of the river? Ahava. Ahava, right? Um, and uh, so then they're going to leave on the twelfth, right? And they're going to arrive at Jerusalem. Basically, you know, just a bit over three and a half months later, right? So, yeah, so we're going quite slow. Yeah, so it's probably still a little bit farther, and parts of the journey can be more difficult than others, right? So, I mean, I, I think, you know, somebody would have to spend time like mapping out exactly what routes they would have taken in those days and what would be the difficulty and what would slow down sheep 
I mean, you're going to have lots of, uh, in that area where Jacob is traveling, it's actually not that bad of an area. Once you get into uh, the area around, well, you know, south of the Dead Sea and so forth, it's it's quite a bit farther, actually, and a lot more difficult terrain for the sheep. Because one of the things about sheep, uh, if you have a flock of sheep, if they can walk, you know, through a wide area, they can move a lot faster. But if they have to go through narrow passages, then that really slows them down, you know, if they're bottlenecked, right? So... And, and same with groups of people as well. But the larger the group of people, that's one of the things about the exodus itself, where the route has to be, because if you have the route that uh, Ron Wyatt has um, and how long they have to get there, uh, they have to go through this narrow valley to get onto that uh, uh, beach there um, along uh, the Gulf of Aquila. Um, and if you count the number of people and how long it would take them to get through that, it would take like at the fastest a couple of weeks to get through that that valley just itself to get through that passage onto the beach. So, you know, there's all those types of logistics always have to be taken into account. And when people are traveling and they're not in a hurry, it's much different than when people are in a hurry, of course. Right. So anyway, thanks for that uh, sort of. And, and these are things that we always have to consider when we read these stories. Sometimes we don't consider these these details, right? We just kind of imagine everything just happens really quickly, and you know, we we, we don't we're not familiar with the area, how it's laid out, and how long it would take to go from one town to another. So they always have to be considered. Um, that's one of the things I considered when it came to uh, the story of. Uh, uh, Samuel Snow riding up on the horse and so forth, and why it made more sense to have that in Boston rather than Exeter, because of where, how far he had to travel, and that would have been sort of a, a bit of a spectacle, him showing up on the horse there, sort of at the last minute in Boston, but in Exeter that would not have occurred, and of course it's in July that that occurs. So anyway. So all these things are, are details that most people aren't going to take the time to look at, but I think are quite important. Okay, so now in this section here, um, and I have like, uh, I'm not sure that, I guess I had two documents open with different things. That's why the blue there. In this passage, we have other, another word for vision besides Kazan or Mara, which is Mara, 4759, the looking glass. While it is simply the feminine form of Mara, it has some added depth in the idea of a looking glass or mirror. It reminds us of two New Testament passages, 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed to the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, James 1.23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man uh, beholding his natural face in a glass. So I think I need to correct this here. The vision that Daniel is experiencing is a revelation of Jesus Christ, um, the beholding of his character. It is the experience of those who study the prophecies. Many speak of beholding Christ, but are not following the biblical examples of what that really means. The time of test is right upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel, whose glory shall fill the whole earth. And for it is the work of every one to whom the message of warning has come, to lift up Jesus, to present to the world, as revealed in types, as shadowed in symbols, as manifested in revelations of the prophets, as unveiled in the, le in the lessons given to the disciples, and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men, search the scriptures, for they are they that testify of him. Okay, so we can see the importance of, of what this means in beholding Christ. So when we have a revelation of Christ, how does that occur according to the spirit of prophecy? How do we reveal Christ in this statement? So how does somebody receive a revelation of Jesus Christ? Do we, do we sit now, I'm not saying that, you know, we don't spend time in prayer, but is it just through some kind of, I'll use the word, spiritual exercise? 
or is it from studying the scriptures? Involves studying, prayer, and obedience. Yeah, so that so there's lots of things involved. And now, in where when we're presenting this message to the world, we lift up Jesus. And to do that, we present him to the world as revealed in types, as shadowed in symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets, right? So we give to them the scriptures as a way of revealing Christ. Now, it doesn't say that Christ's character isn't going to be seen upon us. It has to be. But the foundation is the scriptures themselves. So the idea that somehow I can just manifest Christ's character, I can just you know, and, and these are sort of counterfeits, so they seem to make sense. You know, I need to, you know, spend time with Jesus every day, right? That sounds good, right? Um, but sometimes what people are spending time with is just their imagination, right? So they live in a sort of a, a fantasy world about who God is and, and who they are. Uh, they're not really coming face to face with Christ to see themselves as a sinner. They're not grappling with the sins in their lives and in order to do that we need to come in contact with christ through the scriptures so we can't separate these we can't we can't just have an experience with christ in the way that god wants us to outside of the scriptures obviously nature is also reveals god right so um you know nature is important as well but the scriptures are absolutely essential okay we also find that Daniel, as a prophet, represents God's people. Here, he experiences the first of the three touches. Now, that's the Hebrew word naga. Uh, we believe that these represent the three angels' messages and apply to our time in the repeat of Millerite history. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself, for thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Okay. Now, uh, so just a, a come, couple of things here. So when it says thy words, we're going to have that word debar, right? So we know this isn't referring to the, the debar that's referenced as the 70 weeks, right? So there's a difference between the debar of the 70 weeks and just the fact that this is a common word, the word debar, word. <laughs> Word is a common word. So, and, and you would see, of course, uh, here it's going to be words. It's going to be in the plural, right? Dabarim. So it's not the dabar. It's dabarim. But it's still the same Hebrew number, right? They don't change the Hebrew number, whether it's plural or whatever. Okay. That it takes three weeks from the time when the angel hears Daniel's words to his arrival is not due to an impediment of dis distance. Rather, it is that the angel does not report until an answer to Daniel's plea is ready. This 21-day period becomes a symbol. It symbolizes the 21 years from Daniel's captivity in 607 to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586, as well as the 21 years from Daniel's vision in the third year of Belshazzar in 558. We, also, we should also note that Daniel 10 marks the 50th year since the destruction of Jerusalem, the 70th year of his captivity, ending in the fall of 537. Okay, so it's a little bit of information there. I should probably maybe put that as a footnote rather than in that passage because it might confuse people. So just, 21 becomes a symbol. Yes, Stephen? That's just a thought. Without 50th year, you have like 49 years. In yeah. A way, sort of, so you have like seven times seven. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to take the... The date. So it's the. Sorry, I'll just I'll get back to you now. I just have to check it. I don't want to say about it in okay. case. I just, just had a thought about it, but I have no sure about it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And you forget about it. Yeah, so there's some interesting things here about, you know, the fact that um, we should have had a Jubilee and instead we had the destruction of Jerusalem, but then we do have a Jubilee later when we have. This, the 70th year of his captivity ending in the fall of 537. So so we, we have these structures within the 70 weeks of 49 years. That is interesting. Okay, Daniel's prayer of chapter 9 has been offered in the first year, had been offered in the first year of Darius, um, the Median monarch whose general Cyrus had wrested from Babylonia the scepter of universal rule. 
The reign of Darius was honored of God. To him was sent the angel Gabriel to confirm and strengthen him, Daniel 11, verse 1. Upon his death, within about two years of the fall of Babylon, which was on October 13, 539 BC, Cyrus succeeded to the throne, and the beginning of his reign marked the completion of the 70 years since the first company of Hebrews had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar from their Judean home to Babylon. So that's referring to Daniel, because he's going to be in that first company of Hebrews, right? So from the time when Daniel's taken captive to the fall of Babylon marks the completion of the 70 years, right? So that 70 years is, if it's in the fall of 539, you'd go to the fall of six. Uh, so this is, uh, pardon me. So there's, you're going to have the fall of Babylon, but it's going to be when Cyrus succeeds to the throne within about two years of the fall of Babylon. So that's going to be in the fall of 537. And then you would count the 70 years for the captivity of Daniel from the fall of 607. And then there's 70 years from 609 to 539 for Babylon, right? So this other period of time. I'm not sure why I have this all in smaller fonts. Anyway, even in bigger font. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Okay, so this becomes a confusing part. It almost would be nice if, uh, you know, we could see this, this scene, you know, represented in a video or something so that we could clearly see what's happening. It, it takes a while to sort out. But anyway, it says we should note here that the person speaking is Gabriel. Michael is Christ, and when in conflict with Satan, or, or Michael is Christ, when in conflict with Satan, uh, the prince of the kingdom of Persia would not be Cyrus, but Satan, working upon the heart and the mind of Cyrus in opposition to Christ. The battle is over Cyrus's decision to allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem. In the end, Michael wins, and Cyrus issues his decree on the 24th day of the first month. Those who placed the third year of Cyrus here as 534 BC have no explanation for the struggle over the mind of Cyrus, since the third year, being 536, fits in with the timeline of the return of the Jews in the sixth month of that year, with the generally accepted timing of Cyrus's decree in the spring. This is the most parsimonious interpretation. There is also a reference to the kings of Persia, which requires some consideration. This plural use could be in reference to Cyrus and his son Cambyses. Before his accession, uh, Cambyses had briefly served as the governor of northern Babylonia under his father from April to December 538 BC. As the governor of northern Babylonia under his father from April to December 538 BC. Afterwards, he resided in the Babylonian cities of Babylon and Sippar before being appointed by his father as co-ruler in 530 BC. His father then set off an expedition against the Massageti of Central Asia, where he met his end. Cambyses thus became the sole ruler of the vast Achaemenid Empire, facing no reported opposition. Now that's taken from Wikipedia on Cambyses II, is, uh, which is, of course, he's not Cambyses I, it's Cambyses II. Uh, while Cambyses had not been ruling at this time, he had been a ruler or co-ruler with his father. Another option is to see H4428 Mac Malachi as a reference to counsel or advice rather than to the kings, showing that part of the battle is over the minds of Cyrus's counselors through whom Satan would be influencing him. Then the prince of the kingdom of Persia is Satan and the kings of Persia are Cyrus's counselors. That's the interpretation I prefer, but uh, Michael then is battling over the mind of Cyrus and seeking to thwart the negative counsel through the pride, avarice, and self-seeking of Cyrus's secular counselors. That seems to make a lot of sense to me, right? So instead of taking this as the kings of Persia, it's you got the prince of the kingdom, Persia, Satan, and then the kings of Persia being uh, Cyrus's counselors. May, it makes sense to me whether I'm correct or not. That's uh, a whole other point. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thee in 
befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision that is the kazon is for many days. As we noted earlier, the purposes of Daniel's last vision is to instruct him as to the meaning and purpose of the kazon vision. This is the same vision that was written upon tables, which the Millerites saw as being fulfilled by the 1843 prophetic chart. So I'm not going to read this statement. We're pretty familiar with Ellen White's statement. Uh, the 1844 charts and the 1850 chart, both are 2520 charts with a vertical timeline in the center column with 66, 677 BC and the t at the top, uh, marking the captivity of Manasseh in Second Chronicles 3311 and with either 1843 or 1844 at the bottom. As noted by Ellen White, the 1843 chart contained a mistake in some of the figures. These are located in the top right-hand corner of the chart and are a result of their failure to recognize that there was no zero year between BC and AD, though there was a zero in the math causing the calculation to be one year short. God held his hand over the mistake, which was removed prior to the end of the Miller's, to the end of Miller's prophecies though its implications were not fully realized and accepted until after the first disappointment in the spring of 1844. The Millerites then saw the God's providence, then saw God's providence in the making of the charts. The Millerites then saw God's providence in the making of the charts with the disappointment and tearing hidden from them when the chart was first made in May of 1842. As noted, since Daniel already understood the Debar, of seven of 70 weeks that is the commandment of 70 weeks or the word or the, or the matter or the thing of daniel 9 verse 24 to 27 and the mara of the 2300 days in daniel 8 it was the kuzon and its connection to these periods that still evaded him this point had not been noticed by us until recently in daniel 11 Daniel 11 has always been seen merely as a literal prophecy, its primary purpose to fulfill or to fill in the prophetic history spanning the 70 weeks. This is, of course, part of the purpose. We can see that the Jews had every opportunity since the reforms under Ezra and Nehemiah, you can tell I had not uh, proofread this at all, to fulfill God's purposes for Israel. They are, after all, under a period of probation. Yet when Daniel's last vision is seen as a whole, its full purpose in tying together all the various prophetic periods is clearly seen. Let us take a look at this more closely. As is commonly accepted by Seventh-day Adventists, the 70 weeks and the 2300 days begin together. What is not commonly understood is the necessity of all three decrees. With the third decree of Artaxerxes in 457 BC, completing the requirements specified in Daniel 9.25, you cannot have a third without a first and second. Further, while the 70 weeks addresses the close of probation for literal Israel, ending with the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD, the 2300 days extends the time when God's promises to spiritual Israel will be fulfilled, closing with a parallel to the three decrees, in the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, which were proclaimed in the time of the Millerites. All of the prophetic periods in Daniel are tied together. It is in the seven times of Leviticus 26, with the 25, 20 years for northern Israel, seen in two periods of 1260 years, and the fulfillment of Leviticus 26 for Judah in periods of 70 years, over a 220-year period, from 677 to 457 B.C., that the scope and significance of both the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are fully realized. Ellen White understood this connection, which is expressed in the Great Controversy. So we're familiar with this statement in the Great Controversy that many people addressing uh, the longest, you know, the, the longest prophetic period brought to view in the Bible, the longest and last prophetic period brought to view in the Bible. So I'm not going to read that statement just for time's sake. So so we understand that issue. And uh, so when, when I do that, when I quote it, I put it in brackets, defining which are the periods. 
Of course, we have added in brackets an explanation of which period she is referring to. While some may object to our interpretation, she is simply expressing the Millerite understanding of the prophetic periods. While Seventh-day Adventists might miss the reference and see the last and longest prophetic period to be the only one they know, the 2300 days, any Millerite would readily recognize that it is the 2520 years that both the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are different portions of. Obviously, the 2300 days cannot be a portion of itself. Some argue that the disciples proclaim the first part of the 2300 days and the Millerites the last portion of the 2300 days, that is, the 810 years. Well, there's a mathematical calculation that can be made in this fashion. We never hear them proclaiming the end of the 1810 years. This is also, there's also the simple fact that they did proclaim all three periods and describe them much the way that she does here. Uh, and I'm going to give one example here. So not everybody's familiar with this. This is from uh, Apollos Hale. These several prophetic periods are considered the main pil pillar, pillars of Miller, Mr. Miller's theory of the prophecies. The first grand period, the 2520, which, ex which includes all the rest, terminates with the overthrow of all worldly power. Etc. The second of these periods begins with the issuing of an edict in their favor, but through this, though this period commences sometime after the first period of 220 years, they terminate together in 1844. The third begins at that point where the final change in the visible agents of the long continued subjection of God's people took place, so distinctly pointed out by Daniel, but more clearly brought to view by the Revelator, and so well understood by Paul the future in his day, right? So he's referring to the change from pagan to people. These last named periods that given for the desolation of the sanctuary, 2300 years, and the period at the end of which Daniel shall stand his lot, the 1335 years, terminate together, as is evident both from the nature of the prophecy in each case and from etc. So, So we can see that in that language of, the, of Apollos Hale, you can see Ellen White's the context in which he gives that statement in Great Controversy, page 351. What we what will be seen clearly in Daniel 12 is that the prophetic periods of the 1290 and 1335 cannot be fully understood if we have no understanding of the 25, 20 years for Judah and Israel. We need to see these prophetic periods as a whole, tying the promises of literal Israel to those of spiritual Israel. The Kazone vision has been neglected. Its neglect has led gradually to a rejection of all the prophetic periods of Daniel, a rejection by a church that was founded upon their fulfillment. And we will address this more fully as we proceed through this study. And then we have uh, Daniel 10, verse 15 to 19. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision of my sorrows are turned upon me. Now notice the word vision there is mara, right? Not the mara. So he's talking about the 2300 days uh, vision. And I have retained no strength, for how can I, can the servant of this my Lord talk with him, talk with this my Lord? For as for me, Straightway there remain no more strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a son of man, and he strengthened me and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and he said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. So in, in dealing with this area of the three touches, we're, we're going to have an illustration of the everlasting gospel. And I'm just looking here. Now, it's going to be in, um, I just want to deal with, uh, so the first time we're going to have the word Mara mentioned is Daniel 10, verse 7, uh, the 10th day of the seventh month. So like when we go back here, it was way back here. So you're going to have that Mara mentioned there. The Daniel alone saw the vision. Right now, um, so symbol symbol of the, that verse is a symbol of the tenth day of the seventh month. So he's going to talk about the vision, and he's going to mention that vision twice in that verse. Now, when we get to this later section, 
And so he's going to say, oh, my Lord, by the vision, by the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me and I retain, retain no strength. We have four, seven, five, eight as the word that's uh, being mentioned. So but four, seven, to... five, eight is not mara. Mara, right. right. So it's a different, it's a different word. It's the mara. That's usually referenced to the 2300 days. So a as a question. Now, but, so, okay, but just, just hang on. So I'm just looking at the form of the word here in verse 16. And it should have been in the Strong's, it should have been Mara, because it's actually in the feminine form. So I think the Strong's uh, concordance is wrong here. Okay, go on, Dwight. Okay, now when you are saying that Mara is first seen at Daniel 10, 7. In, in Daniel 10. In Daniel 10. Okay. Yeah, yeah they're just talking about in Daniel 10. Okay. So um, I'm going to do it this way. Should be H. Okay. So okay. So because I was wondering because that didn't make sense to me. Whoops. That he would use the the masculine there, right? So I looked it up because it is in the feminine form, and so the feminine form is four seven five nine, not four seven five eight. Does that make sense? Um, Logical. Yeah, and then I'm just looking at it right here in the Hebrew, and it's in the feminine form. So, and I'm looking on Scholar's Gateway, and it says it's in the feminine form. It says the noun, it's got noun is feminine singular, right? Now, the strong number that relates to that 4758, 4759, and 4760. Now, uh, when we deal with these Hebrew numbers, they're just different. So, when you have the Strong's numbers, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have, um, you know, if it's singular or plural, it's not going to tell you that in Strong's Concordance. So how how Strong had decided to group his definitions, you know, there's different forms. I mean, he, he had to make a decision somehow on how he was going to do that. And he didn't have the singular or plural as the different number. But he does when it comes to masculine or feminine in some instances and not always. So when we look at Mara, this word is actually from 7200, right? Half of 144,000. It's the word means a view or the act of seeing. Um, now 7200 is Ra'a, right? So so what, what's, what's in front of this word is you have this word Ra'a, and then you have a Mem or the letter M, placed in front of the word ra'a to become mara, right? So it's, it's, it's almost like a prefix placed upon a word. So, so the word uh, 7200 means to see, right? Literally or figuratively, and in numerous applications, direct and implied, transitively, intransitively, and causatively, right? So uh, it has lots of different translations in the King James, right? It can even be translated as visions. So mara comes from that word. And then we have uh, mara comes from that word. And then we have the feminine form of that, 4759, and it just means the same thing, a vision. But it also a mirror or a looking glass, right? And that might have something to do with the feminine form because women uh, use mirrors more than men do. And then we have Mura, which is 47660, and it's just apparently a feminine passive causative participle, something conspicuous that is a craw of a bird from its prominence or crop. So it's often translated as, as crop. Um, so that's just a participle. So it's, it's a related word. So you've got these four different words, 7200, 475. 4758, 4759, 4760 that are all sort of related, but they can mean quite different things. So the strong numbers are helpful, but in this case, strong uses the wrong number. I'm not sure why. Now, it could be just a typo that somehow crept in. Uh, we saw that with uh, um, where the word vision is in the original strongs. Uh, they actually had 
the wrong Hebrew number in one place. So they had, uh, I can't remember which one, but they were exchanged. So it should have said, instead of like Kazone, it should have said Mara, or instead of Mara, it should have been Kazone. I can't remember which one it was, but that's been corrected on eSword and in later editions of Strong's. I know my Strong's that I had back in the 19, 1980s had the wrong uh, word for one of those. So it took me a while to figure that out. It was confusing in Daniel chapter eight. Okay, so we're gonna deal with, uh, I guess, these three touches. This is an important point in understanding uh, Daniel's vision. I'm gonna deal with these in more detail uh, tomorrow. The three touches of the everlasting gospel. And I know Jeff addressed these and I, I don't fully know how Jeff understood them, how he applied them. I think he applied them to some events or something. But we obviously have a little bit different interpretation based upon what we understand. Any final thoughts about this review so far? So this is a little, this one, chapter 10, because uh, I've written this out, it's going to take a little longer. When we go through Daniel chapter 11, and it will probably uh, not be that bad because we're not going to go in detail. And then chapter 12, we're just going to bring out the highlights. And then in chapter 12, that's not going to be too much. So we should be able to get this done by in the next two studies, this review. Yeah, so just uh, going back to what I was mm -hmm. thinking, and then I sort of uh, thought about it again. So what I had in mind was you mentioned there the 50th year, so you have like a 7 times 7 yeah. going to sort of connect with that decree. And then... Uh, my thinking was you also have the third to the 24th day for them, three weeks. Is that correct? So it's the third day. Yeah, the third to the, the 24th. First month. Yeah. So the third third day of the first month to the 24th day. Yes. Uh, so uh might be a bit obscure, but I, I sort of uh, connected them three and two, four together to get the number 324 and okay. 324 is uh, 18 times squared so you have an 18 times squared there and then a 7 times squared so you have a 187 then both oh. connecting I don't know if that's so so you're saying 18 squared and 7 squared like in the yeah, so you, can sort of see, you can sort of see it there okay okay that's interesting hmm okay Okay, so thanks. Thanks for that, Stephen. So we'll come back to this tomorrow. So let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. And we just ask for your continued presence throughout this day. Uh, that is, we, we look at, uh, in our personal study, uh, the things that you are wanting to show us, that we can bring these things together, that we can understand them, and that they will strengthen us. Thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.